Hello and welcome to Arvid and Tyler Catch Up. I am Arvid. I am Tyler, and let's catch up. Yep. <laughs> Arvid, uh, what's up, man? How was your week? Oh, I had a great week. I um I was on another podcast. We recorded this a couple of weeks ago, but um it was Yang Su Chung's podcast that mm-hmm. um that I I was on and it was a really funny recording when I was talking to him. He was like in in a closet somewhere surrounded by his wife's clothes and it looked like really just trying to find the best spot to get the best audio in his house cuz I think he'd recently moved or just, you know, starting to build a studio. Mm-hmm. And we had a really really nice conversation and I thought this is going to be a great episode just from the conversation. And then he actually had it produced by, I think, an editor who used to work for NPR. So yeah. the, the quality of that conversation is probably, the, and I don't want to throw shade at anybody else of the 40 plus people who had me on their shows in the past, including uh-huh. indie hackers. But th- that, yeah. that was like a, a narrative, just like you would expect from, from podcasts like Freakonomics or like mm-hmm. 99% Invisible, like a, a really well-produced, thought-out like research, like they they found clips of Danielle and me giving a talk at MicroConf Europe in, in 2019. Like they mm. took some of the audio from the clip and spliced it into the into the thing. It was really good. And it, wow. was, it was it was amazing. I, I actually got his permission to republish it on my own podcast. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that went out um this this Monday. It was such a such a great thing to see somebody put in, I think he paid a thousand bucks to get it edited to that level. Wow. And I'm just, I was just blown away by this. And it feels like such an honor to be the, not just to be the listener, but to be the target <laughs> of that. It was really yeah. cool. So I, I really enjoyed that. It was, did, awesome. um, was the experience from your perspective very different, you know, in the sense that did you have to do much more prep or anything like that? Or it was sort of a normal, you showed up, you answered questions for an hour, and then they just did all the magic afterwards? It, it was all magic afterwards. It was just cool. a regular conversation that we had right. in, in his uh, closet and my Danielle's office that I'm yeah. currently sitting in. It's not even my own space. So we both were in, I guess, our partner's spaces in, in that sense, mm-hmm. because it was like his wife's closet, I think, and, and Danielle's office. But we, we had a, an amazing conversation just about all the things I, I usually tend to have to explain my origin story, like the whole Feedback Panda thing and building this with my partner and sure. why we build it, what we build and you know all these these little things but we quickly got into my method of writing and and distributing like what i write and different media and and he kind of he found this editor that not just went through and removed like pauses or uhs and ahs like he actually turned the whole thing into a narrative that took parts from one part of the conversation and integrated them with other parts pulled them together pulled out like three or four major lessons with examples from the conversation i've never seen this before and i've never had so much attention paid i feel to what i had to say so it was it was just the most wonderful feeling and it kind of sets a bar for me i guess at this point to where i want my own show to go maybe Mm. which is a thing that i've been reflecting on because i do like the format of just having a conversation like being a fly on the wall that is something that that i personally like i like this about podcasts like the one we are currently doing, right? Yeah. We, we don't have like mm. much of a structure. We have some structure because we need structure, but we don't do this like for for effect, right? We don't, as, don't yeah. do this for audience effect. We do this because that's um, what allows us to have the conversation that we want. Yeah. And some people enjoy a, a structured conversation. Some people enjoy just rambling and some people want this this really highly editorialized narrative with like voiceover and sound effects and all that. And I'm torn. I, like, do I want this for my own show, or do I just want to keep talking and keep exploring things as I talk through them? It, it gave me an interesting pause in that moment to think about: Wow, there are so many ways that we can communicate what we want to communicate, which is mm-hmm. kind of also something for us, right? There are many ways we can talk about calm businesses, and many ways we sure. can teach it. So that that was a, a nice little happening for me this week. Um, another thing I did: I'm just gonna go through my whole week. I, I was, sure. yeah, yeah. Um, I think. Today, earlier today, I released uh, my regular weekly interview episode on my podcast, uh, which mm-hmm. this week was with uh, Josh Spector. Like, cool. A really nice insight into audience building and writing a newsletter that's just like a, a line or two, maybe a paragraph and a link. It was really cool to talk um, about brevity, something that mm-hmm. I struggle with, as you can probably mm-hmm. tell right now. Same. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the last episode out of, uh, I think, must have been over 50 or 60 consecutive e- episodes that MicroAcquire or now Acquire.com was sponsoring. 
So I'm now on the hunt for new sponsors and I have a couple leads. I can't say anything definitive just yet, but that was okay. something I spent a lot of time on this week, you know, to yeah. give the podcast a, a, a more financial base, which would eventually allow me to hire an editor for this, which is the whole yeah, point yeah. Of, of sponsorship, right? So to turn yeah. this into a kind of self-sustaining system. Yeah, that was um, that's my, my sponsor hunt still ongoing. I can probably report more next week about this. Cool. And one final thing, I took a bath this week and it was amazing. It was just, <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, I kind of felt like um, I, I needed a nice warm bath because in Canada, it's still kind of up and down, right? That's it's April. It gets super cold. And today's like 21 degrees Celsius here for some reason. And yesterday it was like five and minus five two weeks ago or something. It's, it's quite bizarre change of temperature here on occasion. And I took a bath and I thought, hmm. I have an idea because I was just thinking about this um, this topic that is now the topic of my newsletter for this week. You're building and a set. <laughs> well, You're that would have been set. interesting, but it was it was it was a different topic. But I figured, well, I can still write. I don't need a computer. I had my phone with me, so I started dictating into my phone. Essentially, brainstormed a lot of stuff that I just had going on while I was there, there, like splashing around in the bath. And then later, when I was done, I just threw the whole transcript into Chat GPT, yeah. uh, GPT four, had it generate an uh, kind of an, an article outline for it, and then I wrote the thing right there from the outline, and it turned out to be a pretty solid article. That I and I, I was just um, amazed by how easy it is to take notes that auto transcribe into something that yet another AI can then condense and turn into these kind of structured notes. And I think we've talked about this before, like how I write, but yeah. this was an example of where I wasn't writing in the traditional sense at all. I was splashing around yet here it <laughs> is, right? The, the article is, is done and, uh, and edited and everything. So I kind of just wanted to introduce that as a potential workflow, right? Writing doesn't yeah. need to happen in front of a computer or in front of a typewriter. If you're a hipster, right? You can do this. Wherever you are, you just need a device that captures your thoughts in some capacity. So that was my week. Sponsors, writing, and an amazing podcast episode. Love that. Yeah. yeah how about you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Busy week as well. Um, yeah. So um, it's funny that you mentioned baths. I've also been getting into, uh, like, I discovered that the gym in my neighborhood has a sauna. Mm -hmm. And so I've been going, like, in the mornings, first thing, like, literally, like, wake up go for a walk, go straight to the gym and do like a 20 minute sauna. And that's how I'm starting my day. Mm -hmm. uh, like most days, not every day, really fantastic way yeah. to start the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's been an awesome addition to my, uh, my routine. And now I'm going to start just turning on transcription and talking while I walk. Cause that's <laughs> actually excellent. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. <laughs> now I can justify it. Oh, I'm working. Yeah. <laughs> um, can't take the phone into the sauna though. I think, I don't think it would do well there, but, um, yeah, on our docket, you know, we, so we had a big week. We, um, we closed our, uh, our fur, our fourth fund, uh, this week. So April 1st was the deadline. So over the weekend, we got all the signatures and stuff like that in, and I don't have the final tally, but it's, you know, something approaching 200 investors, which is, um, which is great. It's kind of funny, you know, in this business, you get to just like raise another fund and you're like, hooray, we get to stay in business. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that's where we're at, which is cool. Um, we also have something pretty interesting cooking up that um, I think, you know, well, until this podcast gets massive, we will use it to share a bunch of stuff that's not publicly announced yet. Um, and so we're, we've been working on a suite of very small apps that we're calling Calm Flow collectively. The things we built internally that basically are leveraging. We have this two person team um, at our company that all they do is kind of no code automation and now integrating AI into those workflows. Mm -hmm. And so we have like on any given month, we have like literally like tens of thousands of zaps running through Zapier and make and all those sorts of things. And, and they're really starting to get super powerful now that we're injecting little bits of, of AI into those workflows. And so we're starting to take the most interesting and useful ones that we use every day and kind of micro productize them. Um, so we're releasing a lot of them are Slack based right now, just because that's where we spend a lot of our time. So we're releasing two apps at least for sure. One is a way to export threads out of um, 
out of Slack. So when you have a great conversation and especially in a community Slack, a lot of them are free and they don't have the, you know, the history you want to be able to like rip out a fantastic conversation and add it to the wiki, to the internal, you know, to the circle, to something like that. Um, one click way to do that really, really natively. And then the second one is going to be, um, bringing chat GPT directly into your Slack workspace with like one click, you put in your API key and boom, you have a little bot and then you can do all kinds of cool stuff in line with it. You can say, summarize this discussion we just had into an 800 word blog post and it's just like boom right there so um so we're kind of releasing that uh in beta to our portfolio um so it'll be free for them and then if all goes well and they're interested we're gonna probably roll it out as like a like a subscription bundle of a bunch of different little apps that we like um so that's exciting it's nice to be back in like yeah. builder mode a little bit um so that's cool and uh yeah i had a, like a interesting observation um that I, I just tweeted about which is like i've been dealing with this nerve issue for almost six weeks now and it's kind of just like this persistent thing that's made it like hard to exercise hard to type it's just like been a total drag you know and nobody knew about it really mm -hmm. you know and and it just was a good wake-up call and reminder for me to remember that the person on the other side of that tweet, email, Zoom call, whatever, they probably also have their own thing they're going through. And not everybody is, you know, hanging a sign saying, you know, um, you know, I'm dealing with a really challenging thing with my kid or my dog is sick right now. Or, you know, they don't tell you that sort of stuff. And it's probably better to just kind of go through life assuming everybody that you interact with is dealing with some crap right now yeah. um, and just be a little bit calmer and more patient with with everybody. So that was That's a good reminder. That is really nice. Honestly, I, I, I'm just thinking about yesterday I started listening to uh, one of my favorite audiobooks again, and this is related. Uh, the audiobook is called Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, which is written by Ilya Zyadkowski, like the guy behind the less wrong community, the, the oh. rationalist community. And um, yeah. it's a book, funny, like a Harry Potter fan fiction, if Harry Potter was a rationalist, which is just the cutest thing. And <laughs> um, in, in a way, the what what you just described the the feeling that we have when we talk to somebody else and we completely kind of ignore their circumstances that reminds me of what is in, in the audiobook they they talk about the fundamental attribution error that when somebody else messes up we attribute it to a, a characteristic like some kind of character mm -hmm. trait but when we mess up we attribute it to the circumstances of our lives and oh. what you describe is the exact same thing right you know your pain you feel your body physically and you know that well you just you were in a zoom call you didn't listen for five minutes that's not because you're disinterested it's because you all of a sudden have this little itch somewhere and you really need to deal with it right it's a circumstantial problem but somebody else who watches you not listening to the conversation they might think you're lazy or mm. inattentive right yeah. so it is it is an, a nice reversal of this this fundamental attribution error that we have where we attribute other people's weaknesses to some kind of character flaw when in fact it's just an expression of some thing that happens to them in that moment so oh, i highly yeah. recommend the harry potter and the methods of rationality because it's it's just written as a kind of a, a way into the understanding the methods of rationality right bayesian mm. uh, logic and you know all, all these kind of things in a little harry potter story but it reminded me of that and i'm i'm glad that you put this out there because i feel like there's so much signal loss of um of these these subtle things that we usually do in a conversation like micro gestures or just like mm. affirmative bigger gestures like a nod or something we don't have this in text based stuff right we we misinterpret almost every single message that we receive because we just don't understand from what context it was sent like you yeah. hope that you write things so that it cannot be easily misunderstood but how can you know you don't know the circumstances of those other people so right. it's it's a nice reminder that uh, a lot of context is lost when there is only text. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you're you're doing something about it. By the way, I think the the sauna part is gonna be a, yeah. a big big part of this too. Uh, that's one of the only additions to our house that we have been considering, like having a sauna. Mm -hmm. Because like, we're not pool people, we're not like fancy backyard uh, pagoda people or anything like this. Nothing wrong with either of these. If you want to have that in your house, please go yeah. ahead and do it. But if there is one thing that my upbringing in Germany has taught me, is that having access to a sauna, because that's what my mm. grandparents went to every single weekend, and yeah. 
they stayed alive for quite a while and healthy too, at, at least uh, in, in the regard of like, you know, uh, blood circulation, all that kind of stuff that uh, having a sauna really helps with. That is a great addition to your health regimen, because if you have it at home, you're going to be using it. If you only have it at the gym and you're already not a person that likes going to the gym, you know, it's always kind of more complicated, but yeah, a sauna is, is a good idea. It's just uh, an expensive investment, but yeah, you know, it doesn't necessarily... Seems really fantastic. The the big problem is like you've got like the Huberman Lab podcast and a bunch of these things that um have all started popularizing this research that seems very compelling mm -hmm. that like saunaing almost every day or, or some meaningful amount of it is like this you know, wonder drug, basically, yep. it just like increases your health span, your lifespan, your, you know, decreases risks of all this kind of stuff. And so uh, now I have to go like, in the morning, but but after, you know, like, um, 830, the rush. otherwise, there's just it's packed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a sauna for like eight people. And they'll be like, you know, yeah. 18 people jammed in there if you don't go at the right time so get your own that sounds better <laughs> yeah popularity of, of that with with a public good like this is, is probably or not public but semi-public or publicly accessible yeah that's that's the problem getting your own is and it's going to be smaller right it's going to be different and you you might you have a different it might have a different effect different temperatures that it supports but i think it's a it's a good idea in general so that's the ne next big project after maybe finishing our basement but this is not um based cast this is a an entrepreneurial <laughs> podcast so let's maybe move into our main topic of discussion that we want to talk about today and, before we, um, do that, we have a yeah. request yes we do have a request and it involves this very podcast that is not a home improvement podcast but a podcast talking about calm entrepreneurship i, I just really want people who are listening to this to maybe consider talking to their entrepreneurial peers about this podcast because we try to teach something or at least elaborate on something that we know or are learning about every single episode. And we would really be happy if you could share this and uh, talk to your friends and family and other entrepreneurs that you know about this podcast and just um, give it a, yeah, give it, give it some boost in, 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 in your little community. And of course we would incredibly benefit from a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, that is extremely valuable to us because it just gives us more exposure to people who haven't heard about this podcast yet. And it also gives us the opportunity to learn from your review what you like most about the show, right? What is the thing that makes you coming back and that will allow us to cater to this and give you more of what you already get some, but not enough of. So that would be yeah. my, my request here. I, this is something I've I've changed my mind on. I'll be honest. I think we started this with the idea of keeping it super informal, and so you know, originally I was just like, "Oh, who cares? Why do we ask for requests? You know, I don't care if, if ten people listen to it or ten thousand. You know, like I'm having fun. The point is like to catch up with Arvid, right? Um, but we had a guest on last week, and I really mm -hmm. liked that. And I think we should do a lot more of that. And um, you know, I think we were fortunate, right? I mean, Michelle was very busy, but she had this very important thing that she had to get out. And so she was very stoked to come on. Yeah. You know, if we want to keep getting great guests, we need to at some point be able to show, hey, there's a real audience here. That's That would be the main hook to, to reliably get very interesting folks and really pick their brains. So um, yeah, help us do that. That would be really fun. <laughs> I, I would really like just to, to get some feedback on this because the pod, pod, podcasting medium itself it's, it's like it's a distribution it's like a something that you broadcast right that's the whole idea and it yeah. makes it hard to understand like how we come across like what people like about this and what they want more of so yes please and and this is this is the end of this segment because we could talk about why this is great for us for hours but what what i actually wanted to talk about kind of is related to this because i i just mentioned like apple podcasts and, and spotify and both of these platforms are pretty much the biggest players in their market and if you're mm. not on Apple podcast as a podcaster, if you're not on Spotify and, and using whatever podcasting software you have to distribute to this, you have a problem because most people will not find your podcast because they only go through these apps to listen to particular um, shows. So as a creator, you're kind of depending on your presence on these platforms and platform dependency is something that I have seen like rear its ugly, ugly head over the last couple weeks, mm. very intensely. And that's that's something I wanted to talk about today. Like the, can you stay calm as a business 
and operate on a platform or be highly dependent on a platform. And I kind of want to start talking about this, also mentioning Michelle, because mm. she's she's fighting for entrepreneurs right now. And there's this this letter, this letter to Congress that is effectively a petition, uh, a, an actual actionable and pragmatic petition that people can act on and will hopefully um, yeah, make make a necessary and significant change from. But it's not the only petition that I saw last week. The other one was one to Twitter from the indie hacker community telling them to please, please reconsider their API pricing. And yeah. that API pricing change, just, just the announcement has thrown the community into this array. And because for some reason, the idea was you pay $0 for essentially a free tier that you can't really do much on. Then there's a hundred dollars that is for like a, a, a basic tier where you have a couple thousand tweets that you can pull in in any given month. And then the mm. next tier is enterprise, which starts at $42,000 a month in fees, which is mind blowingly weird. Zero, a hundred, 42 K. So that is. As of now, of course, nobody really knows if this is just another, you know, 420, 69 joke by Elon Musk or whatever it may be, but it, it is a thing. And it's a thing that was officially communicated. And as a consequence, a lot of indie businesses are completely unable to access um, or to, to at least consider in the future paying for this, because if you don't have 42K in revenue, you can't even pay for this one basic thing that you need. Yeah. And there are other things as well. And over the last couple of days, there have been, there has been a significant amount of bans from these tools or for these tools from the API. So API access for tools like Tweet Hunter got banned yesterday. WordPress got banned. WordPress.com. The WordPress.com had their Twitter API access revoked. And then I guess through a couple back channels, they got it back two days later. Mm. <laughs> that tells you a lot of, about the speed of the back channels too. And yeah, yeah WordPress, other tools like Elo.so, Blackmagic had prob problems with that. And it, all of the indie hacker Twitter tools that we know are threatened by this and probably many, many more software businesses in this world. And I wanted to talk about building on a platform like Twitter, what that sure. means for you as a business and how, and if at all, we can deal with this. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this development? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of different things we can unpack there. This is something that we think about a lot, um, especially because, you know, we're frequently investing in companies that have, you know, a greater or a larger extent of, of this kind of platform dependency. And so um, it comes up quite a bit. Um, and let's see where, I mean, where can we go, right? Um, so the Twitter one, I think is is pretty interesting. It is, it is so, um, you know, we invested in, uh, typefully, uh, Fabrizio and Francesco. And mm -hmm. so I was just asking them, actually, I was just confirming for them. I was like, you know, is there, cause they, they announced they're just going to continue, right? Typefully is built, you know, straight off of Twitter. And, um, I asked them, had they, you know, discovered some, some sort of workaround and they're just like, no, they're just paying the, the enterprise tier, like mm -hmm. 40 something thousand dollars a month. And, you know, they're sort of, fortunate that they were further along, yeah. uh, you know, they had outside investment, they had a bunch of different things going their way where they can just kind of eat that cost for a while. Um, but yeah, you're right. If you, you know, if you're going to launch something right out of the gate, you're just dead, right? Or even if you built something to, you know, 25,000 MRR, you're toast. Um, so that is, it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, really, my heart goes out to a lot of those indie hackers, um, you know, that it's like, you 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 always live with the specter of this happening, but even still, when it happens, it just like frankly sucks. Um, so yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'll I'll speak for myself, but maybe for the both of us, if there's anything we can do, any way that we can help, any advice that we can give specifically, you know, feel free to to reach out to us because uh, this is not great. Um, in terms of what we can talk about here, I think. Um, so I kind of, one thing to do is to break down platform risk a little bit. I kind of break it down into two major risks. The first one is just a, a cost inflation, right? So you're, you're using something and they start to charge you for it or they start to charge you more for it. And then the second one, which is not really relevant here to Twitter, but is also there is the idea that the platform releases, you know, what you created for free. Right. Uh, that sometimes they, I, I think the term for it is called Sherlocking, which goes back to, um, I think it was Apple who was sort of famous for 
or like just straight up, you know, ripping off uh, the products that people built on top of iOS. And I'm not sure why it's called that, but but that's the kind of uh, geeky word for it. Um, I well, I have a couple ideas, but what what's on your mind about this actually? Let, why don't you lead it in, in a certain direction, and then we'll we'll okay. go from. I yeah, have some the- counter strategies and things that I think about this, but but let's dig into the main topic a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think let, let, let us maybe define what we think platform risk that consists of, because I also yeah. feel it has multiple layers, right? There's the, yeah. the risk of just choosing one platform. It's like limiting yourself to one platform to build on. With right. tools, analytics tools, they tend to be capable of supporting multiple platforms, right? If you want to have like a social media um, analytics tool to see like what the impression of your social media content is, you can integrate Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and whatnot. You have multiple of these um, platforms that you could support. And if one breaks away, at least you're kind of diversified enough to, you know, try and find another platform to monetize. That is at least um, something you could potentially do to not just be dependent on one platform. But that doesn't make sense for a Twitter tool. Like if you want to support Twitter users, you have to build on Twitter. You can't build on another platform that supports Twitter. Twitter is the only platform that you can automate and support uh, Twitter stuff on. So Mm -hmm. that's the biggest problem that I see in in platform risk is just that that you limit yourself. lock yourself in. It's like vendor lock-in, but from the business side, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just that you choose a dependency you can't let go of. It's like there is a whole business without which you would not exist. Mm-hmm. And we have this um, platform risk. That's kind of the business version. And then we have platform dependency, which is kind of more the technical side, I feel, where mm-hmm. you integrate certain things into your business that are relevant to the functioning of your business that when they go away, everything falls together, like everything explodes or implodes, depending on which direction the explosion yeah. goes. So that is another tech, more technical layer. And we can, I think when you think about platform dependency or platform risk, like every business is built on some platform somewhere, right? So the yeah. question is to what degree does risk exist? How can we mitigate it? Kind of what asking the question of how can we prevent something from um, completely pulling our business with it, should it go. That yeah. is, that is something we should talk about. And for, for myself, um, I've, I've seen this happen with a lot of like smaller software dependencies, like little tools that you use and usually an abstraction around them is enough, but there are things like if Twitter doesn't allow you on the platform anymore, then your whole business might be in peril. What do you think? Like, um, what, what other, I, yeah. or yeah. So sorry. Let's, I'll, I'll, I'll rattle off a couple of these and we'll see which ones we want to dig into. So sure. one is, I think you hit on it, which is that every business has platform risk right now. I think um, I saw a lot of sort of tweets to the effect of, I'm never building on another platform ever again, you know, like lesson learned, like next time I'll, I'll build a platform independent sort of thing. I really genuinely don't think that's possible, especially in tech and software these days. Like you're just choosing the platform. Right. At the end of the day, you're you're always you're not going to be I mean, I guess in theory you could, but you really have to go out of your way to like, you know, start racking your own server so you're not dependent on the AWS platform and, you know, rolling your own uh, SSL code so that you're not dependent on, you know, all this sort of stuff. Like your just dependency is baked in to the world of software because it's leverage, right? You know, you, you, you save your time of inventing, reinventing an almost infinite number of wheels to be able to ship this product by using these different platforms, right? So I think the right mindset is not to sort of say like, platform risk is terrible because, you know, we had this thing happen and what I'm going to do is try to avoid it at all costs because you just will end up like, you know, writing your software on sticky notes, right? <laughs> like you just can't do it. Um, so the question is just how do you assess it and how do you mitigate it? Uh, and then also how do you best take advantage of it, right? Because there is an upside to it. So I think also recognizing the upside of platforms is important because you're kind of making a risk reward cost benefit analysis at all times in terms of how integrated you want to be there is a reason why a lot of indie hackers are in this predicament is because 
you don't have a ton of money on marketing. And so one of the absolute best ways to grow a business when you are under resourced a small team is to hop on a platform. You know, you get to piggyback on their marketing spend, all the TV ads they're running and stuff like that. We saw this, we did a lot of investing and building on Shopify and it was fantastic, right? You built stuff on top of Shopify and they were adding a million sh stores a year. And so you just had this natural customer flow that all you had to do was sort of get in front of. And that's fantastic. And then then you just have to assess the risk on the other side. Um, so I think, I think, um, let me say one thing, which is maybe not going to be that helpful, but I think is potentially interesting. Um, assessing the risk. We have thought a lot. I have personally thought a lot about how can I systematically create an approach to this? Because every application for investment that we see has some degree of platform risk. They're building on Stripe, they're building on Shopify, they're building on WordPress, they're building on top of you know some developer tool platform. I have asked a ton of people about this. I said, how can we create a mental model for assessing, you know, is there something to do with the structure of platforms or the nature of them? And I and we and everyone have come up completely empty for any sort of generalized strategy to assessing how likely is it that the platform is going to screw you over one day in either of those two ways, either raising prices or creating something for free. The only thing I've really found, and this is, I mean, I tell like my investors how we approach this is just trying to back channel to the actual humans that are running the place to just try and understand what are the actual strategic priorities, right? You know, do you care more about power users? Do you care more about creating free features for top of funnel users? Like just, and I know that's not super helpful for a sort of like um, independent entrepreneur, but I, I can, I guess maybe save you the time by saying that there really is not, as far as I know, I haven't seen anybody else with a good blog post or strategy. Every single one of these platforms is just a unique snowflake in terms of how they're going to assess the other side of that coin, which is, you know, basically screwing over some of the people that are building on their platform to meet some other strategic priority. And there isn't really like a generalized approach where you can say, well, okay, that one's going to be low risk. That one's going to be high risk. That one's going to be medium um, because it's just totally dependent on other strategic priorities. Usually it's usually like, okay, well, we need to grow our top line user numbers. So we have to change this or, you know, um, I have some more things. What do you think? Well, un unless you have you have access to this back channel, you're essentially yeah. looking at a black box, right? It's a yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a business that has its own internal motivations that they will not disclose, and even if they talk about them, you can't be absolutely sure that this is the truth or just some kind of. It really reminds me. I was thinking about this also in the bathtub. Um, this is very <laughs> much like what we're currently experiencing with uh, ChatGPT with open air, mm -hmm. with, with these systems where we don't know how they work, where yeah. even their makers don't know how they work because they have an internal mechanism that is completely obfuscated, non-traceable, opaque to the people using it. And in totally. many ways, I think you should treat as an indie entrepreneur, businesses on whose platform you built as exactly that. It's an yeah. opaque black box that may or may not be goal aligned with you. Which is, that's the whole thing in AI right now, right? The alignment problem. Like, is AI mm -hmm. going to kill us or is it going to help us? Is it, one, is it interested in sustaining humanity or does it have its own goals that are not aligned with ours? Same goes for every business on which premises you built your product, right? Where you use their existing capacity and distribution and, you know, the, the documentation and the systems that they've already built. Well, your goals might not be aligned with them. So yeah. what I think in this regard is one, one of the ways out of there for an indie entrepreneur is to shift the alignment more towards you by removing yourself from the platform as fast as you can, at least by removing your fundamental business service, the critical money-making part of your service into your own, whatever it might look like. So yeah. if you start as an analytics browser extension on Twitter, right, you should very quickly move your browser extension into your own software as a service business that ingests analytics from systems like Twitter, but can do so much more. Because yeah. once Twitter falls apart, your connection to Twitter is severed, your standalone SaaS that can ingest things from anywhere is going to continue working. While if it's just a browser extension that hooks into Twitter, well, 
your business is now dead, right? Yeah. That is it. The shifting towards owning it. And I know that owning a SaaS, it's still going to run on AWS somewhere. It's still right. going to have to intercom for your chat communication and you need an email provider somewhere. I know there's still like some kind of dependency there, but it is not the same level and intensity as just, just being listed on somebody's app store is. Right? Yeah. It's a different story. So yeah, yeah that, that would be one like more actionable thing, I guess, that I would like I to think, communicate. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I think, um, so when, when I thought about this in the past, assessing risk, I think is basically impossible. And I'll t I think your point of it being a black box is, is totally dead on. I think even if you have the, the network to be able to sit down and have a private coffee or a beer with the head of platform at X company, and they tell you like, no, 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 we would never do this kind of change, blah, blah, blah. You still don't have that much confidence in that because you don't know that the C, the, you know, the C suite has already decided, like, we're taking this in a different direction. Yeah. You know, we know that this head of platform is not the right fit for the new direction and they're going to get fired in six months. <laughs> right. right. You know, yeah. you really have no idea. And so you do kind of have to assume it's always a risk. And I think there's two counter strategies that uh, I've generally seen work pretty well. The first one is what you hit on, which is just interoperability, right? Like being cross-platform right out of the gate is valuable. One, because you can switch to other services, but also it creates value for your customers that the platform is never going to create, right? right? So, so Twitter is never going to create its own like buffer competitor that allows you to cross post to Instagram, LinkedIn, and a bunch of other competitors, right? They're never going to do that. Shopify is never going to build a tool that lets you easily sync your inventory across Shopify, big commerce, Amazon, all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. And so that's one way you can definitely add value is by being, you know, natively across a bunch of platforms on behalf of the people who pay you money. Uh, so that's one. And I think that's really good because it also gives you that backup plan to just swap things out. Um, the second one is really focusing on power users who have the capacity to pay a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and the main reason is that that insulates you more from the, it insulates you from both risks, right? It insulates you from price increases right? Because you have people who are, you know, much more flexible with their capacity to pay, right? So if you're just like, well, here's this power tool that you already pay, you know, $1,000 a month for now it's going to be $1,500 a month, but it's mission critical to your business and it makes you $50,000 a month, like no problem, right? Yeah. Um, versus like, you know, if you, it's a consumer product and it's got to go from 10 bucks a month to 50 and you're just, you know, completely screwed. The second thing is, it insulates you a bit from the risk of the platform releasing your product for free simply because usually the way that they do that is the more least common denominator type of products are the ones that they release for free, right? So the thing that almost everybody on the platform uses tends to rise to the top of what they'll actually end up releasing for free, right? So, you know, Apple releasing like notes, right? Everybody uses notes, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so, if you can build something that actually only a small percentage of the users actually would use, it becomes significantly less likely that the platform is going to build a free version of that um, and and cannibalize all your all your customer base. So those are like I think my my two preferred counter strategies. Have you have you thought of or or seen any any other more kind of like generalizable approaches to to mitigate that? I mean, other than diversifying, <laughs> yeah. like diversifying from the beginning. And I think what, what you, what you said just now with the second example, that kind of ties into like, generally a, a good business philosophy is to find, find a niche yeah. problem that is not niche because it's just a couple of people who have it, but it's niche because it's specific and commonly mm -hmm. felt among a pretty sizable group of people who have the budget for a solution to that. I think yeah. that it's, it's kind of the, the market first approach in a nutshell, right? Figure out who you're helping, what their critical and budgetable problems are, and then implement a solution to that, to that problem in the medium and the workflow that people already have. It's kind of something yeah. that I tell every single founder in that order, because it just validates the existence of that budget from day one, every single step along the way. Whereas just building on some platform, building some kind of solution to some maybe perceived problem, which a lot of tools start out with, right? People want something, they build it on the platform because it's easy, it's fast, they can quickly prototype it and put it out there. Wonderful. But 
if it doesn't solve a problem that people are willing to pay money for, then yeah. you trying to monetize it is going to be a, a big issue. So even just the approach to what you're building and how mm -hmm. your idea comes to be, right? Is your idea the thing that starts the whole thing or is your idea a consequence of market exploration that mm. already makes you less prone to platform dependency because you will consider why it is so useful to solve this problem and being part of the platform is going to be part of it, but it's not going to be the only thing that you consider. I like your, also your, your value adding logic that you just mm -hmm. kind of put in there. Like the thing you build, if it already adds value that the platform itself would never want to capture because it involves other people, mm -hmm. then that added value that that is a logical like a, a, the core of a business <laughs> that that value add is the business and how you implement it that doesn't need to depend on the platform so i don't think honestly there's much more to to this than like diversify away yeah. from the platform into something that co connects maybe that's the point maybe the the idea in in most things if you look at no code uh, as well like these successful no code tools are the ones that integrate the easiest Right? Yep. They're not the ones mm -hmm. that, that solve the most specific problem by themselves, but they're the ones that solve this problem and then integrate in the surrounding environment. And totally. I think that is generally a good idea, particularly with software, because it's so easy to integrate yep. things nowadays. I think the one actionable piece of advice that I would take away, I would, so what I would not take away from this Twitter experience again is like, uh, platform dependency is terrible. I'm never going to do it again because you're really just picking platform dependency. Like there's always going to be platform dependency. What I do think is a good lesson to learn is probably earlier in the life cycle of the business than, than most founders think or do, you should do a sort of pre-mortem, right? So a pre-mortem is like, okay, we've gone into the future. Our business has been killed for the following reason. Let's work backwards from why. And then you sort of say, how can we pre-mitigate that? I think doing that exercise like much sooner, I think people tend to wait till they're like enterprise tier before they even start thinking about this. But earlier on in the life cycle of the business, you should probably say, let's assess our, let's, you know, pre-mortem. Like our business was completely nuked by, you know, one of these two platform risk uh, scenarios, right? Either price increases or they released our product for free. What can we do now to start mitigating that risk? Uh, because I think, you know, you almost inevitably will have some kind of platform risk in any kind of good business idea that's worth doing and that gets some initial traction. Um, and so you got to just start thinking earlier about how do you make sure that you mitigate that? And that could be as early as in the very first or earlier versions of writing the code, you make it much more interoperable, right? You go ahead and just take a look at the APIs of the competitors that you might need to switch to, and you write a slightly more generalizable, you know, approach to to routing that versus kind of hard coding very specific integrations with with one of of the particular platforms. Um, but yeah, I think doing that earlier in the life cycle, earlier than you think, basically, <laughs> um, is kind of all I would say, but. Yeah, it starts, it starts with technology choice as well, right? I think like from the software entrepreneurial perspective, more the software part than the entrepreneurial perspective, I've run into this a couple of times over the last decade is that there was an integration that was built on one specific tool and now the tool is removed and replaced with somebody else. And now we have to completely rewrite the integration because it just doesn't work anymore. And what I learned yeah. in those many jobs that, that I encountered this with because people that did not think about it was just to have at least one abstraction layer around it. Right? Put some abstraction in there for, for every single thing you integrate. And when I built Feedback Panda, I did this also with a payment system. We had Stripe in there, mm. but I had considered Paddle or FastSpring or whatever, PayPal, like tools that you could integrate that have a charge this person money API uh, endpoint right. or, you know, process a refund endpoint. But I didn't integrate them like in hard code into the code. I had a module that would mm -hmm. charge somebody money. And then that module was implemented for Stripe but could have been easily implemented for every other tool as well. And you can do this amount around almost every single thing that technically you integrate, including your hosting. I think that's also a thing that I ran into with Feedback Panda. I'm just going to put more Feedback Panda stories on here because they were so soul-crushingly weird. Um, <laughs> at, at some point, we were hosting our our um, a whole software stack at a pretty small German cloud provider because we thought, oh, they, they are a startup. They're currently scaling and they can grow with us. We can grow with them. Well, it turned out they didn't really know how to deal with like federation of their servers and everything just exploded into flames and it was really bad. We had outages that lasted half a day, which for a software as a service product that is being used in that time 
like most specifically, like during that particular point of the day, that was really frustrating. We had to re refund a couple of uh, subscriptions and try to figure this out. All, all the while, I think that was happening while I was traveling from Berlin to Canada. So I was in the air for eight hours and then, and it, it, it did, yeah, I was really, I can still feel as you can yeah. probably hear how this affects me. Just, it was really stressful. Classic indie hacker nice nightmare, basically. <laughs> it really was. And yeah. we, we had to, to overnight migrate the whole software stack onto the Google cloud or some yeah. other cloud would have also worked, but we needed to abstract it so it could be migratable. And ever yeah. since then, every effort, that I put into the software was aimed at making it more easily migrated should something happen. And I should yeah. have done this from day one, like to encapsulate it in a Docker container, te <laughs> too technical maybe, but you know, put it into something that is portable instead of something that runs super well on this one platform, because that was ultimately the reason why we had day long outages, because we just did not think about this early enough. So I love the pre-mortem idea. And it's kind yeah. of reminding me of the whole um, the Tim Ferriss's approach to what is it like the, the fear setting that he does, mm. like imagine yeah. the worst case outcome and feel that you can still be okay if you're prepared enough for it, right? Or yeah. that life will still go on. So now that you know, how do I mitigate this? It's kind of the same for your, your personal psychology. You can do this for the psychology of the business and stay calm at that point too. So yeah, I, I really like the, the pre-mortem, early stage pre-mortem. We should codify this. Like let's mm -hmm. maybe, okay, let's pull this in an amazing segue that is not pre-planned at all into the discussion about the Calm MBA. Cause I have this yeah. feeling that this is something that we should teach people very early because I, yeah. I, I think people do not reflect this. If they mm -hmm. think about building a business, people think, um, that, which is also something you will learn in Harry Potter and the methods of rationality. <laughs> this is a great podcast. Um, we should put people, an affiliate link. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> this free, it's completely free. The audiobook and every, yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. You, you should, uh, we're going to put this in the show notes because I think this is um, a bad monetization the, strategy, Arvid. We gotta, we gotta workshop this. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess we should, we oh, should have an affiliate link for something that is free. That, that is awesome. Um, the idea was that people significantly overestimate the, the normal case, average case scenario and the best case scenario too. Like if you ask mm -hmm. people, are you going to be done with this? Um, at, at any given point, like in the next six hours, in the next hour, even if you do, if you ask them like an hour before, if, if they're 99% done, only 50% of them will be right. Like there, there's people just think way more optimistically about the regular case because the regular case in, of any activity to most people is a case where nothing happens, nothing goes wrong, which of course mm -hmm. is not reality. So right. th that is... You know, that is something that if you start a business, you think, okay, yeah, I'm going to build this and then I'm going to get maybe a couple of customers here and then I'm going to do the marketing and, you know, like you optimize your thinking for this ideal case. And then it turns out that two days into your launching a product, Twitter just completely cuts off your API access, right? Mm -hmm. That is something that we can teach people to think about just in the early stages of starting a calm business because it's a mindset thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that should go into the course. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say, because I, yeah. I feel this is very much a, a like a core perspective to have. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Yeah, it fits to a narrative, like a, a little, I don't even know what to call this. It's a thing I say um, about where mentorship can be valuable to entrepreneurs, because I think that, um, in general, I'm, I'm kind of default skeptical of a lot of kinds of mentorship for entrepreneurs, just because I think, I think, um, all right, I'm gonna try to keep this not into a big rant. <laughs> I think I just opened a Pandora's <laughs> box here. Um, Go for it. <laughs> the brief version is, you know, I think entrepreneurship is inherently sort of volatile and, and sometimes cyclical, right? So it's very different from architecture, right? Where, or even more like structural engineering, right? Where the right answer kind of stays the right answer for a very, very, very long time. And you're incrementally building on. So somebody who's done structural engineering for 90 years, like they know pretty much the right answer almost every time. Entrepreneurship changes, it's dynamic, right? Sometimes the right answer is the wrong answer. And sometimes the thing that was the wrong answer now turns out to be the right answer now. Sometimes something that worked doesn't work. And sometimes the opposite is what works, right? So I get pretty wary of trying to sort of be very prescriptive, but there is something that I call seeing around corners, which I think is like the, the area where it's very useful, right? Which is not, mm -hmm. hey, I'm gonna tell you how to assess platform risk. It's more like, I'm gonna be able to walk you through some of the like fog of war of what these kinds of platform risks can look like so that you can see around the corner 
of your own kind of path that you're creating for yourself. And I totally agree. This would be like a great, a great sort of module, you know, once people have settled on an idea or they're trying to evaluate an idea to say, let's do a platform risk assessment exercise to sort of, yeah, pre-mortem it basically. Yeah. I love that. Awesome. We, we should have a conversation about like the, the tacit knowledge that goes into entrepreneurship versus the mm. codifiable and not yet and already codified knowledge that we have. And, mm. and I've been reading up on this over the last couple of weeks, some, some really interesting, really thinky articles about what things do we inherently know, but have a hard time expressing a right? hard mm. time teaching people by anything other than just osmosis, by having them see us do it and learning, experimenting and figuring it out. I think for our, teaching efforts, it's going to be important to understand which things we have a hard time talking about, even though we know what they are, right? Which is such a, like a, a successful or at least seasoned entrepreneurial thing. We have this feeling, it's like riding a bike where you get on a bike, you push forward, you know how to balance it, but you couldn't tell somebody how to do it without showing mm. you, right? Just keep the balance. Well, that's not going to help them keep the balance. So yeah. there's something in there that, um, that you cannot express and we, we should really be careful in finding these things and then either trying to codify them or giving people an alternative approach by just seeing how it's already done and, and implementing it themselves and then learning this test of knowledge just through experimentation. So yeah, yeah, um, that, that would be a topic for another episode, I guess, just uh, what kinds of knowledge we, we are aware of or not even the unknown unknowns of entrepreneurship. That would be super interesting, right? What, what don't we even know? Can we get there? That would be cool. I would love to talk to you about this. The epistemology but, of entrepreneurship. Oh yeah. man, that, that, that like is a, like a meaty topic. <laughs> <laughs> this also sounds like a super boring topic, but yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, could, it could also be quite exciting if we involve more people. I think we... We should just find somebody who is conducive to that kind of conversation and have them on the show. I don't really mm. have anybody on, on, on my mind right now, but I bet there's somebody out there who would lo love to philosophize around like entrepreneurship and what it means to know. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Folks, tweet at us. Who, do, who is the best philosopher of entrepreneurship? That'd be really cool. I would, I would love to know who, when we say that term, does anybody come to mind? Uh, we'd cool. love to philosopher, hear that. The entrepreneurial philosopher king. <laughs> oh man, uh, that, that would be really cool. What I actually wanted to talk to you about regarding the Calm MBA was um, something much more banal. It's price, mm. it's money. I wanted to yeah. to see because I've been I've been thinking a lot about accessibility over the last couple of weeks. Like the article that I am gonna be releasing this Friday is about artificial scarcity and how much I hate it. <laughs> in terms of you know digital tools and digital uh, products how i how i just really don't enjoy when people keep something that can be copied for zero dollars limited mm. to 50 sales right how, and, and the impacts that has on the global economy and the the brand of the founder and the, the community at large so that's what i'm thinking about and in that i was thinking about well what are we going to charge for a product mm. that will be if it is not a, a managed thing, like if it's not a cohort course or anything where we actually highly interact with people, it might be, but there might be a part that is just an info product, right? Or mm -hmm. are we charging for both at the same time? So I was thinking about money and value, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Don't have to take ages to discuss this, but just like to get, to get a general feeling about this. My, my general feeling is that we should yeah, okay. charge some money <laughs> for yeah. a product that is valuable to people because it says a lot about the product and us yeah. as entrepreneurs to charge money for a good product. It's kind of my <laughs> basic philosophy. I, I know this sounds like self-evident, but I don't think yeah. it is in a world where people want everything for free. I think you're right. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm totally on board with that. I think... Um... You know, there is a, there, it isn't a valid question, right? You've got stuff like, um, you know, YC startup school comes to mind as like a, I, I think it's free, right? It's, that's mm -hmm. free. Yeah. Um, and, and several others like that. So it is, it's a question, right? If it's going to be something that's nominally competing, at least for mind share, you know, um, with those products, does it make more sense for it to be free? Like my gut reaction, right, is that we should walk the walk, right? That like that is the sort of like venture blitz scaling approach <laughs> to yeah. to getting that information out there, and we should take the calm approach, which is to you know charge an amount of money. Um, you know, I think uh, to me, charge an amount of money that makes it sustainable, especially in terms of sustainable, in terms of capturing our attention, in terms of potentially you know bringing in more folks to help us, you know 
uh, grow the kind of corpus of information. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's a meaningful amount of money, right? Um, because, you know, we have, we have a pretty high opportunity cost, right? I, I think a big part of why this hasn't already been shipped is that we have a lot of exciting and lucrative projects that we could be working on. So we need to make sure that this appropriately kind of competes for our time and attention. Otherwise, it will, it could potentially decay. Right. If it just, you know, isn't something that allows us to scale. You were talking about wanting to get, you know, a next level of of sponsor for the newsletter so that or for the podcast so that you can hire an editor. Right. It's like not just about, you know, being greedy for yourself. It's about having the revenue to be able to make the product better. Um, so, yeah, I'm totally on board. I mean, I think I think um, I mean, I share your sentiment about artificial scarcity, um, you know, but I do think that there's that we should charge a, a pretty, you know, hefty value for, for whatever version of it it is. I mean, I think we've been contemplating everything from a free course uh, or from a, uh, a self-serve course to a semester long MBA. Michelle Hansen was talking about that last week to even talking about doing like a more of a weekend workshop kind of format, you know, so of course the price will depend heavily on which of those we're actually talking about, but I do think it should feel, um, you know, it should feel pricey. Right. It should make sure that it's worth our time. Um, and, you know, that I think everybody wins in that case. Right. If we feel like it's borderline worth our time, then are we really going to bring the absolute best that we can to it? You know, so I think we, we should start from that. That premise yeah. I was. Yeah, it's a, it's an honestly, it's a super interesting discussion to have, because I feel if it's worth our time, obviously, we're going to be putting in more more effort and it, it will also create a self-sustaining system, which I want this to be, right? I don't just mm -hmm. want this to be a one-off thing. And then people are kind of left alone. I would like to have like an alumni community where there are there's regular exchange with people who went through the program to see where they are, if they need help, if they have something to offer, kind of like what YC does, right? If you, there was sure. this article just last week about uh, going through YC and somebody kind of ranked them as to how, how good it was for them in terms of like making connections and raising funds and learning stuff. And it was a pretty uh, aggressive <laughs> article because it was about the, the YC cohort that went through the COVID remote area or era. Yeah. So they didn't really get much of in, in person stuff. And I think they were also complaining that the moment you go in there and you are assessed that the, all the other VC companies might sell to, you get inundated with sales pitches from everybody else in the cohort. So you have to make sure that this is not just becoming like an internal marketplace or something for everybody else's product, but I wanted to at least have the capacity for people to find other people who can teach them and who can give them something useful. So for that, it needs to be sustainable. I love the word because it needs to be sustained. Like this is yeah. a, a sustained project. This is not just something that we quickly create and throw in and hope to make some cash. I want to play the infinite game. I want to keep playing the game. So that's, that's why this is uh, important to me. One thing that I am kind of having problems with is charging a lot of money that makes this completely inaccessible to people that are not living in the United States or Canada. So we yeah. might want to look into purchasing power parity pricing, something that makes this both expensive enough, you know, to be valuable to everybody, but in the context of the value of their own currency, which makes less money for us, but it makes our whole thing more accessible and more global which in the end could bring in more interest and more interesting diversity, which makes it mm. more, just more real, you know? It's not yeah. just people in the States and in Canada that are going through this, but people in all kinds of markets all over the world. Um, that is something I would consider at least because I've been doing this with my own products. Like every single of my book and courses, books and courses uh, are purchasing parity pricing, parity pricing enabled. Um, yeah. Parity, you know what I mean, PPPP. And yeah. that has been, really helpful for my readers in India and, and Pakistan and, and, and other parts of the world where the dollar is not the same value, right? As it is uh, here. So yeah, that'd be something I, I would totally like to work for that. I think, I think if it's a, if it's a zero marginal cost and marginal time product, I think we should just do yeah. what you've done with your books um, in terms of just making it PPP adjusted full stop. Yeah. Uh, and I think if it's a, a sort of more finite product, so if it's a, you know, cohort based or uh, weekend based, and it does have a finite number of slots. My gut reaction is like having maybe a quarter to a third 
of the yeah. seats are PPP adjusted. Oh, that's also right? interesting. Yeah. You know, because so that, because you know, yeah. like, cool. yeah, I mean, like, you know, we want some control over that, right? It does need to be sustainable. And so, you know, if just by happenstance of when we tweet it, it mm-hmm. time zone wise, you know, the entire cohort fills up with people at the lowest possible end of PPP adjusted, mm-hmm. that could be a problem, especially if we start to hire people for it and stuff like that. Right. So mm-hmm. I think if we, I think we can find some happy medium where, you know, there's a, a a finite percentage of them are PPP adjusted. So the opportunity is there, but also we don't have huge, you know, uncertainty every time about what is the actual revenue we're going to have to work with. Um, that is a great about? compromise. I love that because it is cool. both inclusive and sustainable. <laughs> Perfect. <Yeah. laughs> love it. That's cool. Yeah. A really good idea. Well, thanks so much for, for suggesting this. Um, <laughs> now, if, I didn't think about this again. I'm learning something today. Like you don't have to go either or. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have guessed? Oh, that's great. <laughs> I think, um, what do you think about this? I think for the next time we, we meet, I think we should put a hard deadline for when we're going to ship something. I think we've, we've done a decent amount of scoping. I think we can, you know, we can put something out there uh, for at least for ourselves that says yes. whether it's a workshop, a course, you know, like something that people can actually buy. Uh, by a hard deadline. Maybe we should talk about it this week and set it. What do you think? Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> I would. Okay. Lo- I, I love deadlines, man. The de- deadlines. Deadlines help me a lot. Like right. with just getting something out of the door. And um, if if we can find a deadline by next week, that would also be super helpful because um, the week, yeah, in, in nine days or something, I'm gonna head to microconf in Denver. So oh, cool. I will have something to you know, not officially or maybe officially communicate about this project to all my other peers that might be interested in this. So love it. Great that timing. Would be good to have. What? Awesome. That's a great timing. Yeah. Let's do <laughs> so, it. Yeah, that is great timing. <laughs> Sorry, that was just a little audio hiccup on my side, but this is a live uh-huh. podcast as live as it gets, I guess. So um, this is staying in there. Cool. Um, do you have any shout outs for today? Because I, I think we might be nearing our one hour conversation. Yeah. One minute <laughs> do over. you remember when you initially proposed that we kept this to 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> You like, know what? Like, this reminds me very much of this over optimizing for, you know, like pe- people thinking that um, the average is going to be a certain length. And it turns out. Yeah, yeah, I do have a shout out. Uh, I want to shout out uh, Move Better Sam. Uh, so Sam is a PT. Uh, he's super active on Twitter. Um, I got recommended to him at the very beginning of having this kind of weird nerve issue. I was just like freaking out. It was like my, my fingers are going numb randomly. I have these weird pains, like what the heck is going on? And I couldn't get to, uh, you know, uh, I'm here in New York. It takes weeks to get on anybody's schedule. And so I was mm-hmm. freaking out and a friend recommended me to him. I, I DM'd him on Twitter. He did a zoom call with me, gave me like a ton of YouTube videos and all kinds of stuff right out of the gate that. Um, I'm working with a local PT now because I don't, I don't ex- actually know where he is, but it's very aligned with exactly what he gave me. So he gave me a huge head start and a lot of uh, of confidence about what to do. And he's super um, he's super active on Twitter. He answers a lot of questions and does a lot of just like straight up free you know sort of consultations for people on Twitter. And then you can actually book him for a Zoom call, uh, which again was like incredibly well worth it for me. I got this whole worksheet and anyway. Um, so yeah, move better, Sam. Um, Thanks, bud. Yeah, big shout out to Sam. This is awesome. It just blows my mind that this is the reality we live in. Like we have nerve pain and then we can just zoom somebody and they can actually heal. Heal through the magic of Twitter. It's unbelievably cool. Yeah. That is so cool. Well, I love it too. I'm I hope that you'll be better, even better next week, that this is gonna be less of an issue for you because uh like anything related to nerves is just that gets on your nerves real quick. And um, that, that is a problem, right? If you type a lot and all that stuff. So I yeah. hope you heal a lot uh, throughout the week. And I'm looking forward to talking to you next week. Thanks, buddy. See you yeah. next week.